Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Critical Issues Forum online teachers workshop. And for those who are watching the uh, recorded video, thank you very much for uh, watching this video. Today, I'm delighted to have Ms. Sarah Bidgood for the CIF workshop. Today's lecture title is Nuclear Weapons in the World, Where Are We? How did we get here and what might the future hold? So Sarah kindly agreed to give a two lectures for the CIF teachers workshop. So tomorrow we will have a one more lecture by Sarah. So today's lecture is going to give you an overview of the current nuclear weapon status in the world. As this year's CIF topic is nuclear risk reduction, crisis prevention in a time of international turbulence. It is important to understand the current world nuclear weapon status. Sarah is a senior research associate and a project manager at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Her areas of research include US Soviet and US Russia Nonproliferation Corporation, Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, NPT, Review Process, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, as well as nonproliferation and disarmament diplomacy. This year, she published a very important book, One and the Future Partner, The US, Russia, and the Nuclear Nonproliferation, co edited by Dr. William Porter, our center's director. So I would like to encourage you to get one copy for your study. <laughs> so Sarah is a member of the CTBTO youth group, and she served as an intern at the U United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs during the 2015. NPT review conference. She has extensive experience in nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament diplomacy. This year, recently, she has spearheaded CNS new educational outreach activity, Young Women in Nonproliferation Initiative, which helps women undergraduates professionalize their interest in this field through lectures and events, resources, and mentorship. So I really hope CIF students, especially female students, to follow this initiative and hopefully continue to study nonproliferation and disarmament issues for the undergraduate. So before coming to Monterey, she worked in the field of scientific publishing as a managing editor and peer review manager. Sarah earned her BA in Russian from Wellesley College she also hold an MA in Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and an MA in nonproliferation and terrorism studies from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. So I'm very happy to have Sarah for the CIF workshop. So Sarah, I'm gonna give you the microphone. So now we have a microphone. Thank you. Um, Masako, thank you so much for that glowing introduction, you've <clears throat> made me sound very important. So uh, I, hope I, can, uh, I hope I can deliver. So it's a huge pleasure to um, have the opportunity to speak as part of the Critical Issues Forum again. Um, this is such an important project and um, it's one to which I am delighted to contribute. So Masako, thank you very much again for inviting me. Um, as Masako indicated, today's talk is going to be about nuclear weapons in today's world. And part of what I'd like to sort of do here is explore um, the current status of nuclear arsenals and uh, different elements of the nonproliferation and disarmament regimes. I'd like to look a little bit at how we got to where we are today and then do some speculating about the future. But um, I hope that, you know, if you have questions or if I say anything that's unfamiliar, um, you'll ask me during the Q&A session and I'm relying on Masako to, to also prompt me with some questions. So please be thinking if there's anything that, um, that you'd like me to go back over or that you'd like to ask about. So I'm just gonna start with some basics here. Um, you know, obviously nuclear weapons are extremely powerful weapons. They are much more destructive than conventional weapons. And that's why we put them in this specific category um, and talk about them with, um, uh, in a much more different way than, than we talk about other types of weapons. And the 
part and parcel of what makes them different is the fact that they are very, very difficult to develop. So only nine countries um, have nuclear weapons today, and those are going to be some of the ones that we touch upon here. Um, we're going to talk about uh, vertical proliferation, which is the notion of countries that already have nuclear weapons developing more of them. And we're also going to talk about horizontal proliferation, which is the notion of countries that don't have nuclear weapons developing them. So they're sort of spreading horizontally. Um, I'm going to begin by looking at the status of nuclear arsenals around the world, just to give you a sense of kind of who has what um, and what some of that history looks like. Um, we're going to talk about mechanisms that we have as an international community to prevent the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. Um, we're going to talk about arms control which means limiting certain behaviors that allow you to um, use or develop nuclear weapons. And it also means uh, reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons and their delivery systems. And then we're gonna talk about disarmament, which means getting rid of nuclear weapons. And those two things are often, um, there are some subtle nuances that are, that are uh, different between those two concepts. So yeah, as I said, I'm gonna start by talking about where we are today, and then I'll look at the history of how we got there, and then um, we can look at at where we might go from there. So this is a very helpful graphic that the Arms Control Association has put together that shows, I think, very clearly kind of who, who has what. And the first thing that probably jumps out at you as you're looking at this is uh, that the United States and Russia do have the largest nuclear arsenals today. And the rest of them, um, you know, the United Kingdom uh, and France in particular, and then China, which are the, the the ones with the second through the fifth number of nuclear weapons um, really have significantly fewer, um, orders of magnitude fewer. So um, it's important to, to recognize that the United States and Russia really do have um, sort of a special role to play in reducing the global numbers of nuclear weapons. Um, you'll also note here that Pakistan and India and North Korea are included on this list. And um, Pakistan and India both have again, significantly fewer numbers of nuclear weapons. And North Korea uh, is only listed here as having 15. I remember when I gave this talk last year, um, the Arms Control Association had given uh, a range of numbers for, the, for estimating what North Korea's nuclear arsenal looked like. And I think that really reflects um, the fact that it's very difficult to know exactly what capabilities North Korea has, which is one of the challenges um, in talking about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So we'll get into that a little bit later as well. You'll also notice that Israel is here on this list. Um, Israel has a very interesting uh, um, stance when it comes to its nuclear arsenal. They don't acknowledge it. Um, they have also committed not to be the first to test nuclear weapons in their region. And so from that standpoint, it makes it uh, very difficult to know how to go about um, making sure that, that Israel's nuclear infrastructure is safe and secure because um, there's sort of a taboo within their country around talking about that. So again, these are just some of the, the challenges just on this first slide that you can see um, pertaining to nuclear weapons and their means of control. Um, <clears throat> so one of the key components to developing a nuclear weapon has traditionally been nuclear testing. And it's a tool that states have used both to make sure that their nuclear weapons work. So in the initial stages of developing a nuclear weapon, they will test them in order to make sure that all of the physics kind of come together in the appropriate way. Um, but it's also um, a tool that states have used uh, in the past to refine their nuclear weapons, to make them smaller, um, to make them so that they can fit onto a, a, a means of delivery, a missile. Um, so testing is, is a really um, critical kind of behavior that states engage in when they're developing um, a nuclear weapon. They're also, nuclear testing is also used as a way of demonstrating to the world that you have a nuclear capability. And I think the importance of nuclear testing in both of these contexts has really been kind of set in high relief by North Korea in recent years. And that's something uh, that we can talk about as well. There is a treaty that bans nuclear testing. And Masako mentioned in my intro that I've been a member of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Youth Group since 2016. Um, and 
that organization is, is sort of under the umbrella of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, which oversees the implementation of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And the whole point of that organization is, and that treaty is to, pro is to prohibit nuclear testing anywhere, whether it's in the atmosphere or under the ground or in the ocean. And there is a very robust monitoring system that is used to determine whether a nuclear test has taken place. Um, that treaty has not yet entered into force, despite the fact that it was concluded in 1996, so more than 20 years ago. And part of what needs to happen in order for it to enter into force is eight states need to ratify it. Um, and interestingly enough, both North Korea and the United States have yet to ratify this treaty. So one of the things that we can contemplate, and, and I'd be happy to delve into this in Q&A as well, um, is whether North Korea's sort of declared testing moratorium could present an opportunity to uh, see further progress in advancing the entry into force of the CTBT. Um, nevertheless, in spite of the fact that the CTBT has yet to formally enter into force, it has been very successful in establishing a robust norm against nuclear testing. And the only country that has violated this norm um, since about you know, the early 1990s is North Korea. So that gives you an idea of exactly um, why norms are important in non-proliferation. And um, that's an idea that we're going to kind of revisit when we talk about some of the newer instruments in the non-proliferation and disarmament regimes. So, <clears throat> so where are we? Um, let's talk a little bit about the international non-proliferation uh, regime, which we're going to be again revisiting uh, tomorrow, but it's been relatively successful at preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. So a lot of states historically have considered developing nuclear weapons. They include you know, Brazil, South Korea, Switzerland, Taiwan, Yugoslavia, Iraq, and Libya, um, among many others. Um, and in fact, there's a really great quote from John F. Kennedy in the 1960 presidential debates where he speculates that there could be as many as you know, 20 plus nuclear weapon states by the end of the next presidential term in office, so by 1964. This didn't happen, and part of the reason for that is that a very robust uh, non-proliferation regime kind of developed during that time, and it's one that we've continued uh, to work on, I would argue, relatively successfully. Um, nevertheless, there have been two kind of primary proliferation concerns, I would say, in the past five years. Um, they are, of course, Iran and uh, North Korea, the DPRK. Um, the Iran nuclear deal, and this is actually a picture from uh, of the negotiators of that deal here, was concluded in July 2015, and the objective was to you know, limit Iran's nuclear program in such a way that they, it could not take on a military dimension. Um, and the countries that were party to this agreement, the P5 plus one plus Germany, um, agreed to lift sanctions if Iran would, for its part, agree to buy, abide by limitations on its nuclear program and allow enhanced monitoring by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And this agreement was concluded in, in response to uh, longstanding concerns that Iran was developing a clandestine nuclear weapon. Um, and it was widely hailed as, you know, a, a kind of very important um, uh, outcome of multilateral non-proliferation diplomacy and one that demonstrated in particular the ability of the United States and Russia to cooperate um, in this domain. Now, uh, We'll get into this later as well, but unfortunately, the United States in May of this year withdrew from the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action. And so what we're waiting to find out now is whether the deal can remain um, in place, uh, whether it can continue to limit Iran's ability to develop uh, any kind of nuclear capability or not without the United States participating. And that's going to be a really big question um, over the next several years. So uh, we will see what happens there. But again, we can talk about that in Q&A if you'd like to. Um, <clears throat> so you know, how did we get here? Um, we, you've seen that we have these, continue to have these very large nuclear arsenals today. I should have mentioned at the outset that, um, you know, even though the United States and Russia still have 
the vast majority of the world's nuclear weapons, this represents you know, an 80 plus percent reduction in the number of nuclear weapons that they had at the height of the Cold War. So even though that still seems like a lot, um, they've really managed to reduce their nuclear arsenals quite, quite significantly. So what led to that escalation? You know, how did we get to a place where uh, nine countries have nuclear weapons? Um, I should say first and foremost that nuclear weapons are a very old technology. Um, you know that in you know, 1942, before the time, before uh, the end of World War II, the Manhattan Project was developed. This was the, the US secret project to develop a nuclear weapon. Um, in 1945, uh, the first nuclear weapon in the United States was detonated. It was codenamed Trinity. And this was part of the Manhattan Project, so part of the outcome of those efforts. And it was an implosion device using plutonium. So not a uranium, uh, not a uranium device, but a plutonium device. Um, and that was the same type of nuclear weapon that was used against Nagasaki. Um, later that year in 1945, of course we had, uh, we, the US launched its attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which represented the first and only time that nuclear weapons have been used uh, in a military <clears throat> setting. Um, this actually spurred the very first resolution in the United Nations, which called for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And um, it was adopted. Um, but nevertheless, the Soviet Union did test a nuclear weapon of its own in 1949. So you can see already that there is an arms race brewing even just from the very, very beginning of the US nuclear weapons program. Um, in 1952, the United Kingdom tested. And in 1960, France tested. Um, and in, in only four years later, in 1964, sort of despite everybody's expectations, China was able to develop a nuclear weapon and to test it as well. Um, things slowed down, I would say, a little bit after that. But in 1974, India tested a nuclear weapon. It called it a peaceful nuclear explosion, but it was, in fact, a nuclear weapons test. Um, Pakistan tested in 1998, and then North Korea tested in 2006. Um, and you'll remember that uh, Israel has not tested a nuclear weapon because it committed not to be the first to test a nuclear weapon uh, in the Middle East region. So it's, that's the one that has not tested. Um, <clears throat> so you can tell that I'm already leading into a discussion of mutually assured destruction and deterrence and arms racing. Um, in 1962, McNamara laid out officially the concept of mutually assured destruction, wherein if the United States were to be attacked by the Soviet Union, so the theory went, it would have, um, it would need to have enough of a, second, a secondary strike capability to in turn destroy the USSR. Um, this meant that it was really not to either side's advantage to um, attack one another um, because they knew that the other side would have the forces necessary to retaliate. So this gave rise to kind of the strategy of mutually assured destruction and, to, and of deterrence. Um, but in order to have this robust secondary strike capability, both sides needed to build up their arsenals, they thought, very, very rapidly and massively. And uh, they sort of peaked in about 1986, um, where the number of warheads in the world topped 69,000. So you can remember from the first slide that we looked at, this is, that's really a significant reduction when compared with the height of the Cold War. Um, nuclear weapons increasingly came, became important factors in defense doctrines in the countries that had them. And this has helped to kind of codify the theory of deterrence, even though it's very difficult to prove whether deterrence actually works. So we know that there hasn't been a use of nuclear weapons in a military context since the first and only time that they were used, but whether we can in fact, attribute that to deterrence or whether that is the result of a number of other factors um, is, is impossible to prove. Um, <clears throat> it also helped to develop the concept of extended deterrence, which is when countries that don't have their own nuclear weapons um, ally themselves with the nuclear weapon country so that that country will protect them in case they are attacked. Um, it also, however, spurred the countries that we talked about previously to develop their own nuclear weapons. So you can see that um, 
one of the things that is particularly challenging about the notion of deterrence is that um, if you subscribe to it, it can make you want to develop your own nuclear weapon so that you can deter others from attacking you. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, and we can return to some of the um, attempts to push back against that norm that we've seen in the past several years uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So <clears throat> another important factor in kind of limiting the spread of nuclear weapons and limiting the vertical proliferation of nuclear weapons um, has been US-Soviet arms control. So even during the height of the Cold War, both Moscow and Washington recognized that the arms race was unstable, that it was unsustainable, and that it increased the likelihood of accidental nuclear war. And given that the theme of this year's uh, CIF is nuclear risk reduction, that's a really important, um, that seems like a foregone conclusion, but it's something that is actually very important for both countries to recognize and to appreciate. Um, and in this light, the two sides took steps to conclude treaties that would address uh, this very issue. So in 1963, following the Cuban Missile Crisis, which really drove home to both countries exactly how dangerous it is to um, threaten to use nuclear weapons against one another, the United States and Soviet Union signed a memorandum of understanding establishing a hotline between Washington and Moscow that they could use in times of crisis which would help them avoid miscommunication and prevent accidents and miscalculations that could lead to war. So both sides, if they felt like, um, if, if they had any concerns that they were being attacked, could pick up the phone um, and have a direct line to their counterpart in the other capital and say, you know, hey, what exactly is going on here? And help resolve um, any types of miscommunication that could precipitate a nuclear war, which would be catastrophic. Um, under Richard Nixon, however, the United States undertook the development of new nuclear weapons while simultaneously pursuing agreements with the Soviet Union on limits to their nuclear arsenals, as well as multilateral treaties that were aimed at preventing proliferation. Um, so in 1969, you have the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT, um, and they yielded both the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and also an interim agreement that limited US and Soviet ICBMs and submarine launched ballistic missiles. Um, this agreement focused on the number of delivery vehicles and, and limiting them, so limiting um, you know, missiles um, rather than limiting the number of actual warheads themselves. So counting the number of missiles became kind of a um, heuristic device for reducing the number of, uh, of nuclear warheads. Um, so both sides were able to work around this, as a matter of fact, by, um, by maintaining the, sem the same number or a reduced number of nuclear missiles, but mounting multiple warheads on top of those delivery systems. And that is called MIRVing, and it's something that, uh, that both countries still use today. Um, in 1972, SALT II followed on um, to the original SALT talks, but it was, it was never actually ratified. Um, and then in 1991, the START I treaty was signed and subsequently ratified. Um, however, if you know your Soviet history, you know that 1991 was also the year when the Soviet Union collapsed. And so significant delays in, in the ratification of START I resulted from the fact that uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, which had been very important um, sites of the Soviet nuclear installation, needed to return their delivery systems and nuclear weapons to the Soviet Union um, because they were stationed on their territory and suddenly the Soviet Union no longer existed. And so again, this required a lot of um, very careful and close negotiation between the former Soviet Union, the new government in Moscow, um, the governments of these newly independent states and the United States to make sure that um, these countries divested themselves of these nuclear weapons in which, of which they found themselves in possession um, and, and uh, agreed to become non-nuclear weapon states. Um, <clears throat> so that treaty expired in 2009. And then in 2010, the New START Treaty was signed and entered into force in 2011. 
So again, that treaty cut the delivery vehicle and warhead limits dramatically from their previous uh, limits under previously existing arms control treaties. And it also incorporated aspects of the start one verification regime, um, which was uh, invasive, but also provided a mechanism for uh, both the United States and Russia to resolve um, any conflicts that kind of resulted in the, in the midst of verifying the other party's uh, commitments under the treaty. Um, now what's going to happen is that both sides need to decide whether they want to extend this treaty. So it's going to expire in 2021. And it is possible to extend the New START treaty for an additional five years without seeking Senate ratification, which would be, to my mind, um, a foregone conclusion because uh, it provides a mechanism for communicating between the United States and Russia about nuclear issues, for continuing nuclear engagement in these really important areas, and for verifying what one another is doing. And without that treaty, if we let it expire, we don't have that kind of access anymore. So um, if it's allowed to expire, it will be the first time in decades that we haven't had um, an arms control agreement either under negotiation or in place with Russia, um, which again, to my mind, is, is um, something that is not a step in the right direction. So as I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> even before the Cuban Missile Crisis, JFK had expressed his concern about the potential for more states to acquire nuclear weapons. And in his 1960 debate with Richard Nixon, as I said, he thought it was possible that within the next four years, there could be 20 or more countries uh, with a nuclear capability, including China. <clears throat> so recognizing um, that this was an area of mutual concern, the United States and Russia, or at the time the Soviet Union, cooperated very closely with one another about ways to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons um, in conjunction with some of the arms control treaties that we talked about on the previous slide. And in 1968, after many years of trying and kind of false starts and um, lengthy negotiations, uh, a multilateral treaty was negotiated between the United States and the UK and the Soviet Union. Um, and this non-proliferation treaty, as it came to be called, uh, was ratified two years later in 1970. The treaty itself is comprised of 10 articles. And again, we'll get into some of this tomorrow, but it's basically designed to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons to states that don't already have it. Um, and it already has, at this point, it has 190 states parties um, who are members of that treaty. Um, and the one state that's withdrawn from it is the DPRK. So it's actually been very, very successful at preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and addressing some of those concerns that Kennedy and his Soviet counterparts had identified um, decades prior. Um, <clears throat> the way that the non-proliferation treaty is written is sort of interesting. It codifies only five nuclear weapon states. Remember, there are nine states that possess nuclear weapons, but only five of them are recognized under the treaty, and it's those states that tested a nuclear weapon before January 1st of 1967, which was when the negotiations uh, were sort of nearing their end stage of this treaty. Um, the three other nuclear weapons possessors aren't part of the treaty, and there's really no mechanism to bring them into it uh, unless they disarm and agree to join the treaty as non-nuclear weapon states. Is this something that's possible? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide when we were looking at arms control issues, there were the three former Soviet states, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine, that had nuclear weapons stationed on their territory or that you know, had significant delivery system capabilities uh, that returned these capabilities and joined the NPT, as this treaty is called, um, as non-nuclear weapon states. And we also have the example of South Africa, which did develop a nuclear weapon um, sometime before the early 1990s and uh, disarmed and then came out and said, yes, we in fact did have nuclear weapons, but we've now disarmed and we'd like to join the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. So it is in fact possible for states to do this, for them to decide that they want to disarm you know, unilaterally 
and then to join the treaty. But um, as nuclear weapons be have become a much more um, entrenched part of these states' defense postures, it's probably more and more difficult for them to contemplate doing this. But it's, it's always an objective of the states' parties of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to universalize that treaty and to bring um, the outlier states uh, into compliance with the treaty as non-nuclear weapon states. Um, <clears throat> so again, we can talk more about kind of the implications of this tomorrow, but in 1995, the Non-Proliferation Treaty um, was set to expire. So states parties had to decide whether they wanted to extend the treaty indefinitely or just sort of let it go away. Um, they decided to extend it. So we'll talk about the implications of that um, again tomorrow, but uh, it's just something to keep in mind that that is, that is what we refer to as the cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime because it has played such an important role for so many decades in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, and we'll get into some, it's, it's often perceived as being sort of in trouble or under duress, and we can get into some of the reasons for that uh, in a couple of slides. Um, so how did we get to where, where we, where, this world that we exist in where there really isn't any nuclear testing that's happening aside from North Korea? Um, <clears throat> so the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, as I mentioned previously, has sort of languished for about 21 years. And eight states need to ratify it in order for it to enter into force. And one of these is North Korea, and one of them is the United States. Um, to me, it seems pretty unlikely that um, either of these states are necessarily going to ratify in the next four years. Um, I do think there is more potential for North Korea to consider ratifying the CTBT than there was even a year ago when I gave this presentation. Um, North Korea has come out and said that it unilaterally is stopping testing and that it wants, it, it has destroyed its test site. Um, so I think that there is some potential window here to pressure them to sign and ratify the CTBT, but of course that's a difficult proposition for the United States to do when it itself has not, uh, has not ratified the CTBT. So maybe there's a potential for a, a joint signing and ratification, or perhaps um, it's something that the U.S. and its allies could explore pressuring North Korea to do. But, um, it's, I, it's very hard for me to imagine uh, a lot of progress being made on that front in the United States in the next several years. Um, <clears throat> so where do we go from here? Well, um, as I mentioned previously, the New START Treaty is set to expire in 2021. And if uh, it isn't extended, um, as I said, this will be the first time since the 1960s that we haven't had an arms control agreement either in place or being negotiated with Moscow. And um, one important question I think to consider is what this would mean for the non-proliferation treaty and what it would mean for the stability of US-Russia relations. So we know that the United States and Russia are in relatively dire straits in terms of their relationship. There's not a lot of high level communication between the two countries, um, either at a military to military level or at a policymaker level. Um, and I think that if the new START treaty is allowed to expire, it will become much, much more difficult to negotiate a follow on. So as I said previously, to my mind, extending the treaty for an additional five years is sort of a no brainer. It's something that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it could increase the likelihood <clears throat> that the US and Russia can maintain strategic stability in their relationship and that they can reduce nuclear risk and the risk of nuclear weapons being used, um, both because this treaty caps the number of nuclear weapons that they can have, but it also um, provides fora for exchanging information and for communicating on a regular basis that we will lose if that treaty um, is allowed to expire. I also have some concerns, significant concerns, that um, if the treaty is allowed to expire, it will precipitate a new nuclear arms race. Um, and I think 
obviously this was um, the objective that the arms control agreements that we looked at previously were meant to kind of tamp down on. So they were supposed to address this notion of arms racing um, and prevent uh, further competition between the two biggest nuclear states that would lead to a proliferation, a vertical proliferation of arms. And if we don't have uh, a treaty in place that caps that, I think it increases the likelihood that we'll see a return to that type of arms racing. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the CTPT, as I mentioned previously, I think there are some opportunities to push for the entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and involving this window of opportunity, this target of opportunity that North Korea's self-imposed moratorium on testing has opened. Um, I also think there are measures short of ratification that states could consider that I think would additionally help to advance the entry into force of the treaty uh, when, when the opportunity permits. So for example, um, I wrote a paper last year that looked at the possibility of establishing um, <clears throat> CTBT monitoring stations in India and Pakistan, which are both not members of that treaty. Um, they don't have to join the treaty in order to set up these monitoring systems on their soil, but the monitoring systems would give them a degree of confidence that the other wasn't committing a clandestine or carrying out a clandestine nuclear test. Um, and I think it would be a relatively sort of not politically costly way to move a little bit closer towards ratifying with CTBT without necessarily feeling like they were committing to taking that step. Um, I also think that the United States and Russia could consider ways to um, use the CTBT as an area for potential cooperation. So Russia has ratified the CTBT, but the United States has not. And we used to have very close <clears throat> exchanges with our Soviet counterparts and our Russian counterparts um, at our test sites. So we would invite them to come and look at our test site and we would go and look at their test site. And it was a way of facilitating increased transparency um, and increased communication, particularly between technical experts. So I think even though this would be very, very difficult to kind of revive those types of exchanges in the current political climate, um, I do think thinking creatively about ways to recapture some of that cooperation, particularly in the technical sphere, um, using the, the, the channels that the CDBT provides could be a really useful way to help um, both shore up US-Russia relations a little bit, but then also to be ready to cooperate further when the opportunity presents itself, which hopefully it will in the not too distant future. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the last kind of big thing I wanna talk about here is the review conference uh, that's coming up for the non-proliferation treaty. So you'll remember that this treaty is the one we call the cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime concluded in 1970. It's reviewed in five-year increments. So um, every five years you have three preparatory committee meetings and then a big review conference. And the objective of the review conference is, is for states parties to have the opportunity to see how have we done in implementing the treaty and the commitments that we've undertaken as part of the treaty. And then where do we go from here um, to implement it more effectively and to universalize it and make it more robust and strengthened. Um, in 2020, I think we're going to see some very significant challenges um, for the treaty and for the non-proliferation regime itself. Um, I initially thought in you know, 2017 when this review cycle started that the biggest challenge that the NPT would face would be um, the conclusion of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is a new treaty concluded in 2017 that uh, prohibits nuclear weapons. So it, it doesn't do what the NPT does, which says five nuclear weapon states are entitled to have nuclear weapons if they commit to disarm. It says, you know, these states commit not to have nuclear weapons and they ban nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> There was a lot of opposition to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons on the part of nuclear weapon states, unsurprisingly. And I really thought that that was going to be the big issue um, that would make it challenging for the 2020 NPT Review Conference to come to 
a satisfactory conclusion. I now think that the biggest challenge to the 2020 NPT Review Conference is going to be US-Russia relations, I think. Those two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union and the United States and Russia historically have cooperated very, very closely in the NPT context. Um, they were both the original drafters of that treaty. They really came up with kind of a lot of the, the core articles that comprise the treaty. And traditionally, they've been able to set aside their political differences in order to make sure that nothing too significant threatens the health and success of the treaty. Now, however, in a climate where the two countries are um, really in a state of crisis where there's not a lot of interaction, as I said previously, at a high level between um, policymakers on both sides or, or um, you know, defense officials or military officials, um, they are facing a lot of issues that will prevent them from being able to work together closely and effectively at the 2020 uh, NPT review conference. Um, so if you had asked me three years ago whether I thought the 2020 review conference would be successful, I would have, I think, given you a trepidatious yes. But um, I am much more pessimistic now in light of the decrease, the in further decrease in US-Russia relations that we've seen over the past uh, year and a half. Although um, I hope that the future proves me wrong. So just to sum up before we get into some Q&A, um, there are a lot of nuclear weapons today, but there used to be a lot more of them. So remember the slide I showed you initially represents an 80% reduction in the total nuclear stockpiles that we saw at the height of the Cold War. Um, I think we can also conclude that there are opportunities for further progress. So things like ratifying the CTBT would represent a huge step forward in terms of um, shoring up the non-proliferation regime, extending the New START Treaty, same thing, that would really go a long way towards uh, increasing the strategic stability between the United States and Russia and reducing nuclear risk. Um, but there are also major challenges. So the US-Russia relationship is in terrible straits. Um, I think the US nuclear posture is um, challenging in terms of uh, what the United States is probably going to be likely to do with respect to non-proliferation and arms control issues. Um, the JCPOA, which had seemed like such a, an important accomplishment in terms of multilateral non-proliferation diplomacy may be crumbling. Um, so we need to kind of think about how some of these issues are going to present challenges for the non-proliferation regime in the near future. Um, some of the questions that are important for uh, us to think about in the context of this course, but also as researchers, is you know, how do regional and international security issues impact prospects for non-proliferation and disarmament? So is it possible to continue to undertake nuclear disarmament when uh, the United States and Russia are in such um, dire uh, straits when the relationship is so bad and when both states feel so insecure. Um, <clears throat> same thing with thinking about the Middle East. You know, do you need to have um, a, do we need to achieve peace in the Middle East before uh, states in that region will feel comfortable not only um, getting rid of the nuclear weapons in the case of Israel, but also uh, signing on to the other treaties that make up um, the non-proliferation regime more broadly. So things like the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological Weapons Convention and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. You know, those are, those are the types of sort of philosophical questions that are important to grapple with. Um, something we haven't touched upon at all and which the non-proliferation regime in the way that we've talked about it doesn't really address is the role of non-state actors. So we've been talking about countries and national governments and the decisions that they make surrounding nuclear weapons. But what about non-state actors? What about terrorists? You know, what would happen if a terrorist were somehow able to get his or her hands on a nuclear weapon? Um, that's something that's really important to think about. Um, <clears throat> this is my favorite question. You know, are there lessons that we can learn from the past? I would argue Absolutely, yes. I think um, the history of US-Soviet non-proliferation cooperation and arms control success suggests that the two countries are able 
to put their um, overarching political concerns aside and cooperate on this very important issue. But um, there needs to be sufficient political will in order to make this happen and significant recognition of the consequences for not doing so. And that is an area where I think we can learn a lot from the past about mechanisms for advancing cooperation, even when the larger political environment isn't really hospitable to that. Um, and then my final question is, what questions do you have? And I know a lot of you are going to be watching the recording of this, but I'm hoping that Masako can anticipate some of what you might want to know and help me fill in some gaps if there's anything that I've missed. So with that, um, I'm going to conclude. And Masako, I'd love to hear uh, any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really excellent and comprehensive question. And that I believe that uh, teachers or students who are watching this uh, came up with uh, lots of questions or maybe concerns. Mm. And per perhaps uh, I guess you heard that uh, the current uh, world situation surrounding a nuclear issue it's not so good. That's right. a perhaps the main message. Especially, I heard lots of um, uh, concern over deteriorating US-Russia relations. That's, uh, I believe, I also believe that's the one of the uh, largest concern in the nuclear field. I don't think there is any silver bullet, but uh, you also mentioned uh, these two countries are capable to collaborate given the past example. Mm -hmm. But given the current uh, political dynamics in both countries, maybe could you share your, your thoughts um, mm -hmm. under the current le uh, leadership in both countries? What's your thought or prospect, especially the extension of a New START treaty, which is very important? Mm -hmm. so could you share? I, I know you mentioned, but if you could elaborate this point, that'd be great. Sure. Um, no, that's a great question, Masako. So I, I think um, there are a couple of, of opportunities and also challenges. In terms of opportunities, I think that North Korea actually presents an area where the United States and Russia share a strategic interest. You know, neither country wants to see um, North Korea um, attack, you know, launch a nuclear attack or continue to expand its nuclear arsenal. So they really share an interest in um, preventing those things from happening. What is challenging is that the two countries, I don't think, necessarily agree on the best ways to go about doing this. But um, having a conversation about what is possible and what uh, what benefits they could derive from cooperating in this particular space, I think is something that would be really valuable. Um, I used to say, and I think when I gave this talk last year, I was kind of highlighting the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action as an area where the US and Russia shared a strategic interest in continuing to make sure that that deal remained strong, continuing to make sure that Iran's peaceful nuclear program did not take on a military dimension, you know, now I'm not, I, I don't think that the United States and Russia at the highest levels see eye to eye on that particular issue, but I do think that they both continue at the very core to share a strategic interest in making sure that Iran does not proliferate. Um, you know, in terms of arms control, as I said, I think that there are real benefits to be derived from shoring up the arms control regime. I talked about the extension of New START. What I did not talk about was the fact that the United States has said it's going to withdraw from the Intermediate Ranges Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, I think now that the United States has come out and said that it's going to withdraw from that treaty, um, it will make it much more difficult to conclude an extension to New START, which is really unfortunate. But, um, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. But I do think, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the book that you mentioned in the intro is the importance of doing a, of a, a, a joint threat assessment. So I have some ideas about where Russia and the United States continue to share a strategic interest in this domain, but it would be really helpful for policymakers and leaders on both sides 
to sit down and say, okay, here are my strategic priorities. What are your strategic priorities? Because I think that could highlight some areas that we might not even anticipate where there are opportunities for cooperation. Great, thank you. That was very, um... Great answer. Like, uh, I mean, North Korea, you said North Korea might be the opportunity. Yeah, maybe. But, uh, but uh, Iran, at this point, I also agree that given the US withdrawal from this Iran deal, it's very, one may need to be more pessimistic mm -hmm. compared to the last year. So you also mentioned both countries in, in your book. So now you really, you know, students and teachers, I encourage you to read this book. <laughs> uh, you can buy this on Amazon, uh, anyway. <laughs> so you said uh, uh, both countries should do the joint threat assessment and uh, come to the one place to have a, some summit, to have a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, so I always feel, understand this having a direct uh, dialogue, face-to-face -face dialogue or even uh, uh, hotline you also mentioned mm -hmm. that was used during the Cold War. Do you have, so going back to that uh, uh, dialogue, also hotline, uh, during the Cold War, uh, do you know how many, well, maybe you don't need to come up with the uh, exact numbers, that, did they really use that hotline? Do you know? Uh, I, yes, I think so. I mean, I know that, um, I, so I, I don't think that this is exactly, I don't know that they were necessarily, you know, physically using the hotline or how many times they did that. Mm -hmm. But um, I do know that there were several instances where, for example, um, the Soviet Union would perhaps think that the United States was launching a nuclear attack against it because they would get some misinformation or they would see something on their radar screens that appeared to be a nuclear attack. And because the US and the United States, or the US and the Soviet Union had regular communication and had a modicum of trust between leaders at the highest level, they could often say, you know, I don't trust what I'm seeing on my radar screen. I actually think that the United States would not launch an attack against me because that doesn't make any sense. And one of my big concerns now, and something that I think really touches upon um, kind of the core issues that you're dealing with at CIF is uh, the fact that that type of crisis management and that type of risk reduction, you know, having a ready means of communication if things start to go wrong, um, doesn't really exist in the way that it should anymore. And the trust between the two countries and the leadership of the two countries has really eroded significantly um, as a result of that lack of communication, but um, and it's also in part causing the lack of communication. And so I feel very concerned, and I know that this is a concern you share, that it would be very easy for the US and Russia to kind of stumble into a nuclear exchange because they don't have those types of instruments and approaches and vehicles for communicating that they had during the Soviet Union uh, and during the, the height of the Cold War. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So as you said, the trust between these two countries are significantly de deteriorated. And uh, one of the main reasons is uh, the leadership of, uh, I would say the US United States, not only the president, but his national security advisor. Uh, as many of you know, Mr. John Bolton is a very, is not so big fan of arms control. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> so as you also mentioned uh, in the United, the, the United States uh, nuclear posture review that was issued earlier this year, the degree of reliance on the arms control was also significantly reduced. So given this uh, situation, why I simply, I'm simply wonder wondering why the current United States is trying to reduce the reliance on the arms control, which traditionally the United States took leadership. Mm -hmm. Maybe no one has an answer except for these <laughs> leaders, but, uh, but you know, we analyze 
somehow. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question, Masako. I mean, I thought about this when the U.S. announced that it was withdrawing from the INF Treaty. Um, I think there is a misconception that arms control, a lot of arms control agreements, um, if, it, if there's a perception that they're being violated or that the other side isn't being faithful to their obligations, which was the argument that the U.S. was making with respect to INF, that the answer is to withdraw because you don't want to be in a commitment where you're faithfully holding up your side and the other side isn't doing it. Um, I actually think that's a mistake. I think that by withdrawing from arms control agreements, you diminish your ability to understand what the other side is doing. You get rid of the mechanism that is supposed to keep them compliant. And so, for example, when it comes to the INF Treaty, now any uh, delivery systems that Russia is developing, whether they were or were not in compliance with the INF, are all fair game because the treaty itself will unravel and anything goes. Um, so I, I can't answer, you know, what the current U.S. administration is thinking, obviously, but I do think there is a serious um, logical fallacy in thinking that pulling out of agreements is actually a way of um, kind of giving yourself uh, more freedom or more tools to do what you want to do. In fact, I think it's, it is the opposite is true. Staying in the agreement is the one thing that, um, that allows you to continue to know what the other side is doing and to, to provide you with mechanisms for dispute resolution. And you lose those when you withdraw from arms control agreements. Thank you. So again, so related to uh, U.S. Russia, you touched upon the summer opportunity of a critic. Uh, sorry, <laughs> CTBT uh, mm -hmm. complaints from Nuclear Test One Treaty. There might be <clears throat> CTBT could be the opportunity uh, to remedy the two countries' oh. the relationship. But some people also said now that given the re recent U.S.-Russia relations, now is a like a second Cold War age. Mm -hmm. So, do you think there is any what what is your view on the possible resumption of the nuclear testing of uh, either country? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think a lot of concerns were raised in many people's minds by the nuclear posture review because um, it does basically say that the United States is not going to pursue under this administration the ratification of the CTBT. Um, I don't think that's necessarily news, but it was quite sobering to kind of see it put down in writing in that way. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that, well, who, who knows? But I mean, I, I, Russia is a very, very staunch proponent of the CTBT and in recent years has said unequivocally that it supports the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and that it's committed to, you know, the, the articles under that treaty. So I think it is unlikely that they would begin a unilateral resumption of nuclear testing, um, quite frankly. Um, you know, I, I do think, though, that were one of these countries, you know, whether it's the United States or China or, um, you know, any of the, the other five that have yet to ratify the CTBT, if they were to start testing, I, I think that would be sort of like a, the domino that would knock a whole bunch of other states over and testing would very quickly resume. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important to you know, just having a robust norm against nuclear testing isn't enough. You need a legally binding agreement like the CTBT to enter into force so that the stakes for violating it or resuming testing are they're that much higher um, politically and legally uh, than they are right now without the treaty being in force. Okay, thank you. It's good to hear that Russia is a staunch yeah, proponent of the CTBT. Mm -hmm. So 
I feel a little bit better. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but let's see. Uh, at this point, there are so many things to worry about. Yeah. And now, I would also like to ask you about the Iran deal. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, mainly the U.S. withdrawal from the Iran deal. So, given some people may misunderstand that after U.S. withdrawal, Iran deal is already gone, but that's not the case. So, could you update us a little bit about the current status of Iran deal and some prospect? What is going to happen after this U.S. withdrawal, and what's the implication? to the region if Iran goes back to the pre-Iran deal status? Asako, you're asking tough questions. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, I think it is a misconception to think that just because the United States has announced that it's withdrawing from the deal, that that means the deal is off. The EU countries in particular are very committed. They've come out and said that they're committed to upholding the Iran deal. Iran itself has committed to uphold the terms of the deal. But um, I cannot help but think that without the sort of carrot of sanctions lifting for Iran from the United States, that it's going to be very difficult for them and, and um, not, uh, yeah, very difficult for them to um, continue to uphold the deal. There's not such an incentive for them to keep doing that. I mean, obviously having um, uh, uh, UN Security Council sanctions lifted is something that's that's really important for Iran and something that they're interested in keeping, but those U.S. unilateral sanctions are making their economy um, in dire straits, and when those are reimposed, I think that significantly diminishes their kind of incentive to uphold the terms of the deal by themselves without the U.S. being a part of it. Um, an argument that I've heard recently that I think is really interesting is that the United States is actually violating U.N. Security Council resolutions because there was a U.N. Security Council resolution um, that sort of codified the Iran deal, the JCPOA, and so I anticipate that that is going to be a really big topic of conversation at the 2019 NPT meeting, um, because all of this happened after the 2018 meeting. So we don't quite know yet, you know, how the international community is going to respond to that. I suspect the United States will be pretty isolated with respect to this issue because almost every other country is, you know, in favor of the JCPOA. Um, and has lamented the fact that the U.S. pulled out of it. But, um, you know, in terms of what, what Iran actually ends up doing and how long they can kind of hold out upholding the deal alone with the EU, I don't know. Um, but it would definitely be very, very destabilizing if Iran were to go back to, you know, thinking about or pursuing a clandestine nuclear program. I think that would be... Um, extremely difficult. It would make the likelihood of a WMD free zone in the Middle East, you know, all that much more difficult to achieve. Um, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. So I know it was a very difficult question and perhaps <laughs> no one knows the future, but uh, you are educated. Uh, <laughs> it's very helpful. So Perhaps this is going to be the last question, or maybe you could, with all these um, difficult situation in the world nuclear weapon status, mm. so what would you suggest, especially among the nuclear weapon states, is there any, uh, like, no, no silver bread, but do you have uh, any uh, suggestion to stabilize uh, the current situation? Very vague question, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, yeah, you know, I think... Um, I think that realistically pursuing further disarmament at this particular moment is probably not possible. I think that it's so... The strategic and security relationship 
between the nuclear weapon states is so difficult, particularly between the US and Russia right now, that I can't imagine that they would be able to, for example, um, conclude a follow on to the new START treaty that would have a lower cap on the number of weapons that they could have. I just, to me, that just doesn't seem like it would be possible right now. So short of that, I think where states should focus their attention is on nuclear risk reduction. I think, you know, that's obviously not a substitute for disarmament. Disarmament is still something that needs to happen. It's something to which the nuclear weapon states have committed under the NPT. Um, but, you know, recognizing that that is very, very, very difficult right now, thinking about ways to reduce the risk of an accidental or deliberate nuclear exchange, I think would do a great deal to kind of stabilize a very volatile situation and give the nuclear weapon state something to show to the rest of the world that they are doing um, to acknowledge the concerns that I think everybody has that there would be some kind of a nuclear um, exchange. So that's, you know, that would be my, my suggestion, but it certainly is a very difficult uh, situation at the moment. And I can understand the frustrations of the non-nuclear weapon states in particular who want to see a further reduction in nuclear weapons. And I can also understand, you know, the nuclear weapon states saying this just is not something that we're able to, to do right now. So for me, you're right, it's not a silver bullet, but risk reduction, I do think, is an area where we can devote a lot of a lot more attention and a lot more resources to thinking creatively. And that might do a little bit or, or a lot, in fact, to um, quell some of the fears that a nuclear weapon would be used. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, so I would like to conclude today's session, but Sarah is going to give you one more lecture on NPT. So maybe we may have some associated question, uh, but uh, anyway, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really um, a comprehensive and a very insightful uh, lecture. Thank you so much. So thank I you. Like thank you. Thanks, Masako. Thank you. Okay, I stopped the recording.